SCP.com. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Bold and Better Show. I am with my co-host, Matt Colseth. Well, hello, J.D. Hey, Matt. And I'm J.D. Hoobiner, uh, the owner here at Bold Patents Law Firm. We're here for you, the inventor, the entrepreneur, the tinkerer. And this is a, a really good show today. We have a, a guest waiting backstage, Dr. Aaron Dossie. Uh, he's with All Things Bugs. Super excited to have him on in just a little bit. We're also going to be doing uh, a few questions that came in over the week, Matt. A uh, couple on trademarks and one on patents. And then we'll do a uh, Shark Tank episode that is kind of with the theme. I try to do that. Um, as we go, we do welcome any live questions that we get from our Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube audience. You know, we are broadcasting live, so that's the cool thing. If you are watching this after the fact, you can tune in next Wednesday uh, at 1.30 Pacific and ask your question live. Uh, so let me do a quick little disclaimer. As always, we're a, we're a law firm, we're attorneys, but we're not giving legal advice today, just legal information. As Matt says, um, and you you know if you don't like what we say, you know we'll give a full money back guaranteed. Yep, refund. Yep, if you're all your money you paid in, it's coming right back to you. Yep. No questions asked. Uh, Matt, how's your how's your May starting out? Oh, it's great. I haven't done any work today. <laughs> That's fantastic. I uh, I played hooky today. I took the my oldest daughter broke her arm, so I took her uh, to get her formal or final cast on this morning and then I decided to take the rest of the day off. So, yeah. Good for you. Well, you're being a good dad, taking care of your daughter there. Is she, uh, is it her dominant arm? Yeah, she's a lefty. So she broke her left hand. Well, I'm going to hope, hope and pray for that to heal up soon. Yeah. Thanks man. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Although I have an, I have an injury I, on my knee. It's, um, it's a bursitis pretty bad. Oh no. Um, dude. Yeah. It's the worst I've ever had. I, this is the same knee I heard in football, you know, classic high school football injury. Yep. And it just blew up on me. So having a hard time getting that thing to heal. Get, get an old for the birds, as my grandma used to say. I know you say. <laughs> well, I had a gal I used to work with. Um, gosh, where's her name? Worked at Boeing. She was a little on the older side. I want to say Bonnie, but it's not Bonnie. It was like a classic name. Anyway, she would say, uh, get an old ain't for sissies. Yeah. She was a southern gal. So it's just with the accent and everything, which is super good. Um, Okay, let's jump into it. We had a couple questions uh, that came in. Um, uh, I'll tee it up for you, sir. Right. This is your first work activity of the day. Yeah. Um, let's see, let's see I still got it. Yeah. Okay, this is a novel one. Um, this is out of uh, good old Orlando, Florida. Oh, beautiful. Okay. The topic is, how do I know if my company name is infringing upon another trademark? Hire me. That's right. Give us a chat. Give us a go call. Ask, go ask them. <laughs> no, don't do that. So, yeah, that's basically the answer. The U.S. Patent Office has registered a trademark for Radhesive, which is a form of radiological and medical tape. My business name is Radhesive, this is a plural LLC, and we'll be registering through SunBiz in Florida and focus on direct consumer stickers and magnets for decorating vehicles. Huh. Radhesive's quote is not an existing company name, but if I set up the business, uh, in other words, the Secretary of State's going to have no objections. But is right. there an issue on the trademark side? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting, interesting question. So um, you're right. I mean, Florida's not going to have a, an issue with Radhesive so long as there's not another Radhesive LLC or corporation in Florida. Right. But from a trademark perspective, um, you're, you're likely going to be, well, you know what? It's This one's kind of, this might be the first one that kind of stumps me a little bit. I might say, I might do some more research on this one. So, you know, if you're in the medical products class, like this registrant is, and you're doing stickers and vehicle wraps or whatever, right? Yeah. Those two are not, you know, in the same international class of goods and services, but they might be, they might be related, right? They're both right. using adhesive um, and the name is really unique. Red adhesives is uh, a coin term, right? So... If you have a coin trademark, something that's really arbitrary or random or made up, um, you don't have to be as similar to a prior filed registrant in order to be a, you know, find a likelihood of confusion. So um, I'd say talk to an attorney about that one. But because the name is so unique, they're definitely going to see you when you do go to market, in which case they might have a problem with it. So I think my opinion would be to, you know, think of a different name potentially. Very good, Matt. Thank you for that. And we have a comment here from another attorney, uh, Mr. Bosland. 
could be a bridging the gap thing. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it could certainly bridge the gap in the sense that, you know, the names are really unique and there are sort of a connection or you know, two touch points in, in the adhesives between the two. So, yeah. Yeah. It would take a little bit of research to see if those categories are somewhat related. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, and on that note, if you want to reach out and have a chat, um, here's your link, live link. Uh, this is for a 15 minute free discovery call with Dallas. Get to learn about who we are, our whole process. And then uh, if things go well in that discovery call, we'll schedule you to meet with Matt or yep. one of our patent attorneys. So that's the link right there. And you get a copy of my book, Old Ideas, The Inventor Guys Patent. Is, um, is, that on the, is that on the New York Times bestseller list yet? Gosh, it's on its way, Matt. I think the second edition just missed. I appreciate that. Yeah, no, we, uh, we're we doing good there. So this is a good one. It's a good question. I've been, I'm excited to answer it because it does come up. You know, um, we are not immortal. Uh, so this is my dad passed, unfortunately, and I have two of his patents. I'm not sure what to do. No, I don't know what to do either, JD. Yeah, I'll <laughs> walk through some stuff. This, there's some more to the question. I'll pull it up. <clears throat> Um, cause this is part of, you know, what can get into estate planning where patents kind of meets with other areas of law. Yep. So I'll, I'll put this up here. Um, he's a bit older. I want to see what routes he can take. Um, my grandparents recently moved in and I inherited some things. So upon discussion, I found it was, uh, discussion with Chrysler at the time. And that's pretty cool. And need to be some modification done to it, which you already suspected. Um, because of his, his health, they hit the back burner, never saw release. Okay. Well, a couple of things there, now that I see with Chrysler, I mean, typically if he's an employee of Chrysler, I would guess that the patent is actually owned by Chrysler. Uh, but if he's just in conversation, if he's an individual, private individual, sole proprietor or an LLC, potentially discussing a licensing deal or a sale of his patent portfolio to Chrysler, then I think you do have rights to consider. I think getting with a patent attorney to first and foremost, make sure that the patents are still enforceable is important before really going any further see how much life is left, if you will, on those. And then um, the next order bit, if they, assuming there is some life uh, to it, you would want to have proper assignment done. And there are mechanisms in the MPEP, the Manual for Patent Practitioner um, <laughs> Examining Process. And uh, yeah. uh, for, for doing just that, for, for a deceased inventor, um, usually it'll follow the will or a bite and test date. And um, you're assuming you're the heir, you'll get ownership and get that as a patent assigned, recorded, and then you've got full authority just as if you were the inventor. So um, then you could. I'm actually dealing with this right now with a with a client, a trademark client, and mm -hmm. uh, I've never had to do it before. But yeah, I'm assuming basically we'll have to you know wait for the estate to kind of go through probate, yeah. and then you know his son will become the executor of his will, and then at that point we can assign it. Yeah, yeah. What's cool about trademarks is, of course, there's no exp no expiration. Nope. So long as the nope. business exists, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I would think that we wouldn't want it to abandon, right? And so the sooner we can get the assignment, the better, right? Because you don't want to have an LLC out of business, you know, inactive or, you know, um, an individual owner you know, who's deceased, you know, on record as the owner because, yeah, you know, right. we want to make sure that that trademark is active and enforceable. Totally. Yeah. And so, you know, in this case, so even if, you know, you got other things going on in your life, too busy, you know, in other words, you don't really have the same zest for the invention. Um, you can get, you can sell, right? Patents are fully transferable. You can sell them, license them, get them in the hands of other individuals, business owners that can do as this person wanted to get it out in the world to kind of, you know, see his father's dream through. So lots of ways to go forward. Uh, feel free to click that link if you're interested. Um, Matt, let's bring on our guest. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right, uh, welcome Dr. Aaron Dossie to our Old Inventor Show. Nice to be here. Thanks for Thanks being <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I, you're tuning in from way overseas, right? Actually, not much sea involved. I'm in uh, Honduras. Oh, Honduras. Okay, so yeah, you're, so a long way away. If I was, yeah, I'm not a geographic type of guy. <laughs> Where are we at in the world? Central America. Um, Central. Yeah. So technically, technically, you could drive here. Okay. <laughs> very, very good. So I would love to get just a, b a brief little background. All things bugs. Walk us through what is the company and then give us a real quick on what the invention is. And then I've got some more questions for you. 
Sure. So All Things Bugs LLC is a biotech company in the food and sustainable food and agriculture space. I started uh, when I was unemployed back in 2011. I was applying for faculty jobs as, uh, as well as grants, trying to get leverage to get a faculty job. And I got a Gates Foundation grant that I literally had to file an LLC to qualify for. They wanted to fund it, but I wrote down independent as the affiliation says, so they said, you have to work somewhere. And I said, can I work for me? They said, no problem. <laughs> and so I had to wait a year to get that whole process, the paperwork for them to approve it. And then, um, yeah, and I've gotten lots of uh, SBIR funding from the USDA and DARPA and just kind of continued along it. But it started with the concept of insects as a sustainable uh, protein source in food ingredient source. Yep. And this kind of spun off into a bio resource. We've done some genetic engineering work with the DARPA funding and looked at and, and are looking at maybe vaccine production and some things. Um, but primarily it's a, a, a food ingredient company and uh, our P is around, IP is around the food processing uh, aspect. We've done a lot of product development. We're trying to get investors right now to scale up and kind of really bring this concept to the mainstream food industry. So eating bugs and, and, and not just the eating, but the processing before eating. Yeah. So the concept is uh, farm raised. So not collecting from the wild or any weird thing that some journalists may want to sell clickbait on. Um, uh, not whole bugs on a plate or anything, just grinding them into a powder, uh, into an ingredient, maybe extracting oil and just treating it like any other food ingredient. Um, uh, you can see in the video that you're playing there, some, uh, well, that's on the cover of my book, but um, uh, extruded snacks, cereals, just anything where it's a, a food that can accept a high protein ingredient. You can incorporate insect protein rather than uh, dairy and some less sustainable options um, and less clean label options of things that use antibiotic steroids and hormones, which insect farming does not. Um, and, um, and then you have a, maybe a higher quality, uh, more sustainable product if you, use, if you use this protein ingredient versus others. Okay, so is, I'm gonna I'm gonna interject here. I had crickets this weekend. Oh, how were they? You know what? Uh, I'm not gonna say yeah. delicious, uh, but they were better than expected. How's that? Okay. We were we went to this um, really well regarded Mexican restaurant in Minneapolis, um, and uh, they serve a lot of like authentic Mexican food. And mm -hmm. yeah, they had crickets on the menu, so we're like we're we're ordering those. <laughs> Yeah, I assume those were probably called the chapelinas. They're probably grasshoppers. From I don't know. They, they, they called them crickets, and they were small. You know, they weren't like you know crickets like um, we have here in Minnesota. Oh, okay. Um, then maybe they're using crickets in the tacos. Yeah, they they were they were okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I, we could talk about the invention for a long time, but and that's where mm -hmm. I want to spend the next couple of minutes. So, is it the getting it into a powder is fine enough, or is the it the Getting it into the powder is the ultimate goal of the steps. Uh, the The core of the innovation is grinding them before drying them. So when I got started, everybody was ro were roasting them in ovens and then grinding them up after the fact. But that requires a lot of heat. It requires a lot of energy. You're cooking it, so you're really destroying a lot of the, uh, causing a strong flavor, aroma, losing fats and oils. Uh, probably losing nutrients. Um, you're just making a much lower quality product. And then even if you mill it and try to mill it fine, the protein is stuck to the exoskeleton instead of separate and kind of a, a fluffy type of deal. It doesn't blend as well with other things. But if you grind it into a liquid and pasteurize it like a, say, milk or some kind of liquid uh, protein and then and then spray dry it or use some other kind of drying like um, spray drying is the kind of the main version, but we have coverage on other drying methods. But if you treat it like a liquid and, and then dry it, you end up with a much higher quality product, much scale, more scalable for the food industry. Wow. Very cool. And you mentioned that at the beginning of your conversation, one of the toughest things I know I've heard from my clients, which is raising money. Um, and you, so you found that initially, you said with the Gates Foundation grant and then SBIR. Um, and then there was maybe another one, DARPA, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Give us kind of your, if you can, maybe the top one, two or three golden nuggets, like lessons learned going through that process, if someone's looking to start that? Boy, um, I'll avoid don't. <laughs> um, just as a trying to start from a scratch as an entrepreneur in the United States, considering our don't, economic Don't do system. it at all. 
don't go well, there. I mean, I mean, if you look at the, you know, the the resource, we'll say resource instead of wealth, because that the other term scares people, resource distribution, yeah. uh, a lot of things as far as uh, oper- eking out opportunity to be an entrepreneur in the United States is very, very difficult. And it requires lots and lots of resources that very that fewer and fewer people have. So I would say that's just be try to understand where look forward and to, to three to five years where your money is going to come from sales uh, and not don't try to start a year in advance. But uh, SBIRs and, and things, I would say it's if you can make a successful business, it's a great lifestyle. You know, you, you have a lot of flexibility. You can do creative things. You don't really have limits on other than how you pay for it, what you can do as far as, you know, product services, taking a different direction on a, in the business and whatnot. Um, but uh, one of the things that people assume of grants is that when you get a grant, that's all your money and there are no rules and you can do whatever you want with it and you're rich now. When I got the Gates Foundation grant, which was only 100 grand for an 18 month project for, on which I had to live also, I had to pay myself a salary while doing the research, um, it, it goes very fast and you don't get to keep all that grant money. Yeah, um, so. You get grant money, you get to use it however you want. Not sure. Yes, yes, you, you do not. And SBIRs in particular are a weird kind of co- a combination of small business versus uh, research grant. They have a high, depending, and they vary widely depending on the agency, whether it's NSF or DARPA or USDA or whoever, how they run, how they're managed, what the expectations are, what you get, what the rules are, what you can and can't use the funding for. But almost all of them have a really strong research requirement to do a lot of to do research and not so much product development. And there's very little funding, if any, for commercialization, which is ironic because you're expect the whole point is to develop a product and innovation and bring it to market. Yet you're not allowed to really spend money on anything lasting equipment, facilities, patents. Um, there are some agencies more in, in the past, maybe two or three years that have offered little supplements you can get with the, the finally the recognition that, that you know, you know, the small businesses tend not to have a lot of extra capital for uh, marketing or for any commercialization activity. So you're allowed some for commercialization, but it's very small and you have to use it very wisely. And it's like a lot of times where you're not, I guess, some uh, some people in my family would say born on third base or you don't have a lot of cushion. You have one shot. Okay. As an entrepreneur now, if you don't have, you know, come from, you know, money or aren't part of a big thing, you have very few chances to lose. And, and, and the same with that. It's called with the USDA. I think it's called TABA. I forgot what the acronym is, okay. but it's just enough to pay for a little bit of a marketing and website and maybe a provisional patent. And okay. so it's not like you can, fail for a year and come back in two or three years for the same pot of money and say, Oh, I need, I finally figured out the, the golden magic to market this product. Now I need the marketing money. You've already yeah. spent it. Yeah. And it's done. Have you seen the government to come forward with any uh, internal uses of your discovery? I assume that you, as part of t- accepting the grant money were required to give them a license to make yeah, that, product. I, I think that's true of all SBIRs. Right. I understand the military does things different sometimes that when they, if they want something badly enough, they have, they kind of have yeah. a, more flexibility to do what they want. in a lot of things, one of what I'm told by my consultants, so yeah, you might be able to hold on to it and sell it. Like if you're do an airplane part or a weapon system thing is kind of the thing I've been told that like, if you, if they really want it, but they know you have to survive as a business, they will still pay you for it. Um, even though technically they could make it in-house or the government doesn't have factories uh, and a lot of production facility uh, themselves. So if it's something the government wants, they will tend to give you dibs on the contract. And and there might even be some, a clause in the SBIRs that says they have to, I think they do have to give you, they are allowed to do it if they can use it with government, do, make it with government employees. So, you know, if the USDA ARS office somewhere could just make everything in-house and do what, and, and make what they needed, they, they have a lot to do that. But if they need any outside resources, a factory equipment and the contractor, you, they have to contract to the inventor first. 
Okay. And then you can subcontract just like, you know, like and you need 200, you need a million pounds of cricket powder by when, but I can go to Nestle and say, help. And I can subcontract to them or some food ingredient company that can take, that can do what my company can't technically do. Yeah. And so you are, um, you were, you and I were chatting before you are looking for investors now to kind of do exactly yes. that go to market. Yeah, we already have lots of product prototypes. We've done 13 years of R and D. We have the patents. We've, I've gone to market with the ingredient. Um, we know a lot about how to market it, where to market it. Um, one of my errors was being, was focusing on R and D and being an ingredient company yeah. rather than, um, going to product with the consumer facing market. We don't get any brand rec recognition. We don't get any marketing buzz being an ingredient company. So I'm ready to kind of take some of our prototype markets to think that uh, the product market. Good, good. Well, are you okay if we share your email address out here, if anybody wants to reach out to you? Sure. I sent a, um, a list of links to, to my book. I've got the all, uh, Insects and Sustainable Food Ingredients book um, and my website and our social media. I sent an email to you earlier. Awesome. Well, I wanted to share that here with everybody here. And thank you, uh, Dr. Dosen, for coming on and sharing your invention. And I mean, you've been at this for 13 years. This is something you're not just going to give up on. You're, you're going to make it happen. So it's a matter of time, right? Hopefully we see you, you know, and, uh, you know, a everyday type of a protein that we're out there. I know I, for one, have kind of abandoned dairy. So it's great to hear there's other options for, for protein sources. Yeah, yeah. Check it out. I'm, I'm currently still optimistic. <laughs> Well, thanks again. We'll, we'll keep you backstage. We're going to go do our bold bite now. So thanks a lot. Thanks, All right. Man. Take care. All right, Matt. So you took a cricket. Would you ever, you know, say you're eating a protein bar and you happen to see, oh, yeah, it's insect protein. I wouldn't mind. You going to think twice about it? No. Uh, no, probably not, actually, <laughs> at all. Well, give it a shot. If yeah. it tastes good, I mean, if it tastes like rubbish, then it's yeah. going in the trash. But um, if it tastes good, yeah, I don't care. Right on. Cool. Well, let's do it. We're going to switch over uh, and do a little, uh, little bull fight. Of course, it's related to bugs. And this is a pitch that was done way back called Buggy Beds, different type of bugs, bed bugs. Ugh. You ever had any bed bug issues? Uh, never here in the United States. Well, never in the United States. In Canada, yes. Uh, and Egypt, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I read something interesting back in like the 1940s and 50s. Um, yeah. You know the expression "Don't let the bed bugs bite." Uh huh. About half the homes in the United States had bed bugs. Half. Half. Ugh. Well, I kind of if you can't see it, it's not that big of a problem. Yeah. What about you? You ever had any bed bugs? No. Well, there was a yeah college. There was an issue. Um, but let's uh, let's get to our bold bite today. Um, I'm going to share. Oops. Turn off the uh, subtitles here. Okay, let's let it rip, okay? Maria Curcio and Veronica Perlongo, who believe they have a solution to a nationwide epidemic. Hi, my name is Veronica Perlongo, and this is my partner of 15 years, Maria Curcio. Our product is Buggy Beds, and we are seeking a $125,000 investment for 7% equity in our company. Buggy Beds is a bed bug glue trap that is an early detection system. It's designed to attract, trap bed bugs dead. Simply slide and hide buggy beds between your box spring mattress, under your couch cushions, and buggy beds will provide peace of mind for everyone. Sleep tight and don't let the bed bugs bite. <laughs> well, let's see who's going to bite. <laughs> Can we have a look at the product? Absolutely. Sure. Veronica's going to hand you out our travel pack to take you with you to hotel rooms. How long have you guys been doing this? We launched the product about six months ago. Why we're here is we have a weakness. The weakness is the big box distribution and the retail stores. Oh, so you want help in getting retail distribution? Correct. Does this eradicate all of the bed bugs? This has been designed actually as an early detection system. It's a vision that would go to a hotel with one of these, put it under my bed and say, whoa, I got to change rooms. There's bugs in here. We've actually even had that happen. Whoa. Everyone keeps asking the same question. Why are we so infested? Because there is no really good early detection no, exactly. system. Is it tested and proven yes. or is this your claim? We've tested it, worked with a couple of entomologists, dermatologists, as well as myself, came up with the formula. We just had a housing authority, for instance. We sent them a case of 144 traps at their request for a sample three months ago. They just placed an order last week for 22,000 traps because of the successful results. Wow. 
it's not toxic in any way. No, it's non-toxic and pesticide free. Buggy Beds is patent as a design in 34 countries. The trademark of the name Buggy Beds and the logo itself is in 42 countries. The utility is pending in 50 countries. Who is actually doing the manufacturing for you? We're actually taking it in-house now 100%. It's very cost-effective and easy. What is the suggested retail price of each of those? The two packs are uh, $6.99 to $8.99. What is your cost of making it? A dollar thirty-five. What are your sales right now? Uh, currently, our sales are one hundred and fifty thousand. We started with Home Depot's website, and they just picked us up for sixty of their stores that we just shipped out this week. Oh, you never said that before. With this product, correct. We also just got a purchase order from seventy-five Burlington Coat Factories as well. Can I say one other thing? On the one hundred fifty thousand dollars in sales, we have a hundred thousand profit. Nine for six months since you've been this. Correct. One hundred and fifty thousand for six months. You're valuing the company. You're asking for one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for seven percent. Correct. Correct. You're, you're saying the company's valued at around one point seven five. Why are you valuing the company at that? That's a great question. Before we launched, I was offered five million dollars for the trademarks and the patents from a company. Whoa! Wait a minute. And you turned that down? Yes. What? Shh. I thought the same thing. What? Five crazy. million dollars? Yeah, that's a lot of money for never going to market or something. Yeah, my number one thing was, and I watched the rest. They actually had a pretty cool story. They had five sharks going on a deal with them. How about, Mark, how about young Mark Cuban, by the way? Oh, Dang. 2011, 2012, brand new season four, maybe 2013. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, you can it's see the- It's been, they, a, hard, they, it's been they, a hard decade. <laughs> Yeah, some crazy now. Um, yeah, that's a lot of money. I kind of call BS. I um, agree. Million dollar. So I dug up what they did have. Um, there might have been some some bugs in the system. So they had one issued patent. I think she might say so, a design patent. And a design patent is about a three dimensional object that is that can be manufactured. So I want to show that off. They did get it issued. Um, and so design patents are only good for 14 years as opposed to 20 years um, on the utility side from the date of uh, grant. So uh, 2012 plus 14 means in a couple of years the thing's going to be expired, right? But they've been in business for a while. Um, they do have the, this novel BB, um, which is you know, distinctive and probably unique enough to get them the, the design patent rights. But unfortunately, the utility patent went abandoned. They must have given up. They had a lot of office actions. It went, they did assign it to their LLC, uh, but it never got issued. So hmm. they didn't respond to what probably was a pretty uh, significant um, rejection. So the, um, the the design patent is still there, of course. And, and yes, there are ways to go through the Hague agreement to get industrial designs um, granted in different countries. Um, the one thing I always look at when it comes to patents is, hey, uh, is there any way to design around this thing? Um, and design patents certainly are vulnerable to that because if you change really any significant part of that three-dimensional shape, just use two different letters in that, um, yep. you're no longer infringing. Um, so I think given that, it's uh, very unlikely that someone's willing to give up $5 million um, for just the two-letter shaped uh, bug trap. Um, so that might have been a little bit of a, you know, deception, a little you know, persuasiveness on the spot. Um, so that's my ba my major critique on the patent size. They, they came up short in terms of what they're able to get the rights on and limited to just one design patent. Um, but they did, uh, they got the sharks to come on board and I think they, they've been doing well. They're still in business. They've got a website up, uh, Buggy Beds. Um, any comments or review critique on the trademark side? Yeah, I mean, so they, they do have a you know pretty extensive uh, portfolio of trademarks, um, both word marks and design marks. And then I am also looking at, you know, this is the first one that I've taken a look at internationally for, for this yeah. client, because she mentioned she had like 40 or 50 different countries. Yeah. And I believe it, you know, they're registered in, they have word marks and design marks in class one for insects, traps, insect traps in the U S EU, um, Mexico, Canada. Um, Wait, class one. The first 20, class? Class 21. Oh, 21. Okay. No, that was like the first class they created was insect bugs. Um, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom. I mean, they spent a fortune on trademark registration. Okay. So maybe that was the part where there could have been an initial offer. 
based on market, you know, market maybe, scope. Maybe, so. man, but it's, it's, that's a lot of trademark applications. Okay. Yeah. All right. So maybe that, that, and that's a good point. I guess that's one, uh, one, a good argument to the other direction. Maybe they did get a significant offer. Yeah. Uh, but they were talking about how they're, you know, they're, they're steadfast. They think this is a multi-million dollar company. They wanted to, you know, be business owners and she called herself Mrs. Wonderful on air. Um, so anyway. Uh, yeah. The, the older woman, New Jersey. Yeah. Gosh, I love that accent. I miss that New Jersey accent. Yeah. <laughs> and that attitude, that. that New Jersey, New York attitude. Yeah. She hits you in the face. So, I mean, I, no, no doubt uh, a solid businesswoman. Uh, so very impressive, I think, overall. And, you know, aside from those uh, couple of critiques I had on the patent side, I think they uh, they had a good pitch there. Yeah, um, I mean, whoever their uh, trademark attorney is, they definitely put their kids through college with this client. <laughs> that's awesome. Good deal. Well, um, Matt, that's the end of our time, our time together, unfortunately. Quick half hour. Uh, Always a pleasure, JD. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. So for Matt, myself, and for our guest, Dr. Aaron Dawson, we wish you guys a great day. We'll see you next week on the Bold Inventor Show. Go big, go bold. Go big, go bold at boldip.com.